I've got everything torn out that needs to be torn out. I've uncovered the existing drain lines and I have new drain lines to put in. I've got the grade kind of established for that. And so let me show you some of what it is that I need to accomplish now as I put things back together and get this thing ready to build on. So this yellow line is not building line. It's about eight inches beyond building line. And I use that for the approximate line that I want to run through this edge of the project in order to tie a new French drain into what we uncovered right here. That's a six inch corrugated culvert, if you will. We're tying onto that and putting it in a PVC perf pipe. This little invert right here is gonna receive the pipe after I grade it out. We've got an eighth of an inch per foot of fall coming down here about 40 feet, turning outside of the building line and then tying in to this eight inch corrugated culvert, which runs up and down the back of the property inside a 10 foot easement to receive water like this. So I'm gonna swing you back around and just point out that this is about the edge of the RV parking pad the way it was when we came in here a week ago. There's six inch gabion rock underneath and one inch minus on top. We're gonna to reconstruct this extra width with one inch minus, it's gonna be rolled in really hard with that little vibratory double drum compactor that Brian Reynolds has loaned me. So you remember this little concrete pad that had the sewer and the power and the water coming up out of it when we were tearing this place apart? As it turns out, the sewer is not just for gray water, but it ties right into the sanitary sewer that the, that the house is tied into with clean outs all the way out to the street that we've discovered. So that means that this is gonna work great. All we're going to do is turn it and bring it over into the interior of the pad once we get that up to finish up to the elevation that we want it. We're going to reconstruct and recompact this material that I threw back into the trench that we made to get the um, utilities understood. And then we're going to bring this thing up to the grade that we want before we start setting forms. Right after location, the next and uh, probably equally critical thing to determine on any kind of a building is how far out of the ground it needs to be. In general, higher is better because higher implies the water getting away from the building and having room to accommodate drainage. And, and that is uh, the big deal, the elephant in the living room. And it's easy to step on your tail and think you're gonna save some money in fill or concrete or some other part of the, of the building by letting it sit closer to the ground. Resist that impulse, get up out of the ground. In this case, I'm constrained by the height of this existing garage floor being about 10 feet away from the height of the shop floor that's going to be right over there. I don't want the shop floor any higher because that would kind of create a tendency for water to come from that elevation back into this building and I don't want it any lower because I don't want the water that falls on the ground in front of this garage floor to end up you know too close to the shop floor just 10 feet away. So we're visualizing a matching finished floor elevation with lots of cross slope like 12 inches over to the far side of the driveway that I can use to slope the apron away from the new shop and in fact create a little swale between the doorways of the new shop and the existing garage. So anything that does come from the sky and land on that part will either come across this driveway or into the backyard. Very important consideration. So this is the French drain corrugated ADS, I think it's called, or just culvert tore it apart here with the excavator. I'm going to get back to where it's clean and controllable and put this adapter that takes it from this material to six inch PVC. But I need a nice clean end. This material is perforated all the way around. It has little slits on the, the high side on the interior and it loves to kind of clog up and it loves to fail. I mean, if you, comp if you compact on top of that stuff, it'll crush but it's typically less expensive and uh, code compliant, and so there you have it. But let's see if we can cut this off and get rid of that nasty new sharpening job that I just put on my Leatherman. So that is almost full of dirt, I think because of my amateurish excavator operation. Yep, the dirt ends right there. 
So there is a projection in here to match the indentation of the culvert. I had real questions about whether or not that was going to engage. Turns out it has. So we're going to tighten this down and then use this as the flow line and set some grades on down the ditch. So this string is for grade on the French drain. I'm going to compact some of the one inch minus that I can scrape up off of this pad down to 12 inches below that string. 12 inches is the length of a square shovel, pretty much. So we can sprinkle gravel in there and then just use the string at the top of the shovel to strike the grade off, then we'll compact it and fine tune it. I need the pipe to be laying in there, not perfect, but well enough that the water will stay inside of the space in between the perforations on the bottom of the pipe, just so the water will carry. What the pipe is really doing is preserving a hole in the dirt so that over time there's always a place for the water to go and at least a fighting chance that it will end up in the main drain at the back of the lot. Well, I'm ready to cover it up. This is the design. We've wrapped it with filter fabric, actually road fabric. We poked a few holes in the road fabric because it doesn't like to let the water through, but I think we've taken care of that nicely. We didn't glue the joints. Struck me as stupid. I mean, this is gonna be contained. We, the thing is designed to leak and it is clearly captured. The joints aren't gonna open up ever. And it goes around and slips right into the adapter from eight inch to six inch, pretty nice. So we're gonna pull the, fil the road fabric back, poke a few more holes in the top because road fabric doesn't let water penetrate like filter fabric does. But this is all we had around here today. And then we're gonna get ready to kind of level it out, drop some one inch minus in there and start compacting for real. So what's going on here is trying to get some moisture into this crushed rock. This is one inch minus. That means the rock has been crushed and everything it'll fall through a one inch screen will go into a pile like this. If there's not moisture in it, it won't compact. And this was crushed today and it didn't rain today. Therefore, this is bone dry, like no moisture at all. And in order to get compaction, the moisture has to be what is known as optimum. Now, different rocks from different pits each have their own testing data called a proctor, which is specific to that pit and that rock type and, and, and. And I don't know much about that and I'm not paying much attention to that. We're just gonna mix water in this and kind of mix it up until it will clump a little bit. Not so wet that it is saturated because then it doesn't compact right either, but just until it seems about right. We'll put it in place, put the compactor on it and make it very hard. Batter boards are the boards that are put around the perimeter of a building, a structure, with the top of the batter board set at finished floor, or whatever the controlling grade is, it's important that the batter boards are not only set for line, but also for elevation. So the rough, the rough excavation, tearing out the concrete walks and part of the asphalt and digging the hill back and establishing some drainage meant that a lot of the reference marks I'd put on the ground are obliterated. But I put these in here far enough back because this side is the control line because of the setback from the property. So I know that this line is about one foot back of the building. That exact distance is negotiable as long as it doesn't get any closer than five feet to the property line. I know that this 
was the line of the front of the building after we squared it up and decided we had the right location for the whole thing. What that means is I'm not going to be able to get these batter boards clear back from the actual forming that's going on, which is desirable. You like to have your batter boards back at least five feet from where the work happens. We're not going to make that here and we're not going to make that down there. So we just have to deal with it. This is the other end of the corner we were just talking about. It also is constrained, so I can't get the batter boards five feet back from the, from the building itself. But I can get them far enough back that the work can be done. Once these two corners have the boards up, I'll put this string in place, and then, critically important, the, the point on the string that identifies where the corner of the building will start relative to the setback. These batter boards are not consistent. The ones on this side are held way back, like five feet back because I have grade to repair in here. Same over there. Over on that side, I was stuck having to just kind of mount them, you know, pretty much at the edge of the dig and the dirt work because of that cut bank. But really it's okay. It just has to be whatever you can put together that will be as efficient as you can make it and not cause any kind of rework or tear out or an interruption in your layout once you're ready to go because you put your batter boards too close to the scene of the crime. Lark's head, Lark's foot, girth hitch, cow hitch, whatever you want to call it, over the nail. So I've got plenty of water in this. It's not evenly mixed, but I think close enough. Um, I mean, the water migrates back and forth and will probably even out. Hopefully, the compaction will be as well as it needs to be. Right in here is mostly under a sidewalk. The building will run across over there where that plumbing um, clean out is that we're going to be able to use for the sanitary sewer in the bathroom. That's a real home run. So I'm just going to finish grading this little bit and then beat it into submission with that little vibratory roller. What a cool thing that is. It will, I am told and I believe, compact, you know, a pretty good lift. And so I put a pretty good lift in here and we're gonna hammer it down. heard me talk probably several times about expansive soils and structural fill and those kinds of things and as I'm just finishing up the last corner where I need to do some over excavation on the on the corner of Ben and Amanda's shop I've got a chance to show you kind of what I'm talking about I'm sitting on about a 24 inch cut right here I went down 24 inches because the corner of the building got off of the the RV parking pad which has a nice subgrade it's got one inch minus compacted on top of six inch um, base rock. It's really hard in most of the site. In the areas where we got off of that site, of, off of that pad, I put in, I over excavated, I put in one inch minus and have compacted it really hard. And this is the last spot for me to do that. Let me show you the difference between the soil that is not expansive and the soil that is expansive. When this house was put in here 20 years ago, they brought in some topsoil into the backyard because the black mud that was everywhere here before that is just really hard to deal with, not only under a building, but under grass. It's just kind of miserable. Here is a transition between the topsoil they brought in and the black mud that was here first. Right here is where the topsoil, which is really just silt from the Umpqua River, you know, it's fine. It's probably a little bit expansive. But it's not as bad as this stuff. 
you can see the transition from the brownish sandy kind of material right here into this clay and can you see that having been exposed to the sun for the same three days over the weekend this remains pretty much as it was and this begins to crack and pull apart with the shrinking that happens when it dries even after just a few days now here we're down to black mud that is still wet but as that dries it gets smaller and smaller and cracks and pulls apart and is just unworkable what this means is you have to keep this material like about 24 inches below the surrounding exposed soil elevation because 24 inches and down there's a fairly uniform moisture content all summer and so your building is sitting on something that is not going up and down as it dries and moistens and dries and moistens. Now I don't want to pour a footing 24 inches deep so I'm going to come up with about six inches of compacted structural fill on top of the black mud when I uncover it which means that the black mud is still 24 inches down and even though the concrete doesn't go the full distance it's sitting on something that is predictable. So we're going to go ahead and pull out, I don't know, maybe five or eight or ten more yards of junk, throw it away, come back with good material and we'll be ready to start forming concrete. I don't know, maybe tomorrow. So as far as I know, Brian thinks this thing weighs 11 or 1200 pounds, he ought to know. So that's concentrating a lot of load, you know, on those two drums, and it's vibratory. Mechanical compaction is absolutely mandatory if you're going to get any kind of a real compacted base, like 95, 96%, hopefully. Um, I worked with a very good man in Wyoming who built nice custom homes, and at that time, the technology he was aware of would let him just soak fill. We had a three-quarter inch pipe we'd put on the end of a garden hose about five feet long and just force it down into the into the backfill around basements and stuff and sure enough it would get wet and it would subside but I know now it wasn't compacted and those poor people had to keep adding dirt to their flower beds around their house for a long time mechanical compaction is vital I have reason to believe and this is a hip shot that a little vibratory roller this size will handle or compact a lift of this one inch minus, I don't know, 10 or 12 inches thick. We're at about 10 inches thick right here. We're gonna hammer it into submission. And if any of you know better, if you may think perhaps I should have used a smaller lift or maybe I could have stacked some more dirt in here, let me know in the comments and uh, I'll do better next time. So what could be simpler than shoveling, right? I mean, maybe hammering. But as it turns out, in the 21st century, almost nobody knows how to hammer and not many people know how to shovel. Now having said all that, anybody can move rocks with a shovel, but as far as moving the rocks efficiently, you have to be able to use a lever. Leverage is everywhere. Burke bars are the epitome of construction leverage, but there is a right way to move gravel horizontally and a wrong way. Now I'm not talking about picking it up and putting it in a wheelbarrow, I'm talking about simply moving it from point A to point B. Here's the wrong way. That'll kill you, and you won't get any work done. Here's a better way. Make a fulcrum out of your thigh, and a lever out of the shovel of the, the handle of the shovel, and just rock like this. See that? You see how much easier that is on your back and on every part of your body? It's using several muscle groups instead of this and that. So I'm gonna go ahead and just move this laterally, sweep it off fairly flat, and then we will beat it into submission one more time. Now there's another thing that perhaps bears mentioning. When I worked for MS Concrete, Dennis Bunker, now departed Dennis Bunker, was the most forceful and uh, frankly intimidating man I ever worked for. And I didn't know him until he was 55. But he would tell the guys that were grading, and they had dozens of men whose sole job was grading, Take the high spots and put them in the low spots. And it sounds so juvenile, doesn't it? But you have to learn to think that way. You spend your time shoveling, identifying the high spots, and don't touch anything else. The high spots always go into the low spots or else you're duplicating effort. Sorry if that sounds too entrance level, but there are some of us 
who will work a long time before we figure that out. We've moved about 40 yards of rock in here. We took out about I think probably 20 yards of junk and we brought about 40 yards of rock in and we've got it compacted nice and tight to within about six inches of the finished floor elevation. Finished floor is going to be on top of four inches of concrete. That means we have about two inches of vertical distance to come up. We've stopped at this point because I've got to dig the perimeter. I'm going to dig the footings down into this nicely compacted one inch minus which is going to produce some extra material that we want to lose into the subgrade if we can. All of this to say that now we are going to put up the building lines perfectly because moving forward from here, location really matters. The batter boards are in place. You've seen those go in. We'll get you a close-up shot of some of those. They're okay. The site's not big enough for them to be really sanitary, but they're certainly adequate. But today we're going to locate perfectly the lines that that specify, that make permanent exactly where the building's gonna happen. That means we have to create a rectangle 36 feet long and 26 feet wide. And it needs to be square, meaning all four of the corners need to be exactly 90 degrees. Now there are some old school ways of doing that where you, and you'll see us mimic that here in a minute, where you use your tape measure and check the diagonal measurement until they are the same and you adjust the strings and you, move them incrementally until both of the diagonals are exactly the same and that's a huge waste of time because those diagonals are actually the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Let me show you. Our building is going to be 36 feet long, 26 feet wide. Please ignore the streaks and stains that are caused by bat urine in the shop and then dust sticking to it. It's a permanent addition. But imagine that this is a representation of the footprint of this building. 36 feet, 26 feet. The diagonal measurements that everyone fixates on and adjusts incrementally to get it square occur in this direction. That's a diagonal on the rectangle or the square. It's also the hypotenuse of both of these triangles. Can you see that? Now on a right triangle, the three sides have three different names. Well, let me say that again. According to the Pythagorean theorem, the three sides of a triangle are represented with three different letters. The two sides that represent the sides of the building are also called the legs of the triangle and we're going to call them A, B, and the diagonal measurement or hypotenuse is C. Mr. Pythagoras did the world a huge favor and moved, moved civilization way forward when he discovered, when he figured out that the square of the two legs combined equals the square of the hypotenuse. Isn't that amazing? So what that means is we take a squared plus b squared is going to equal c squared. Now don't let your eyes cross and lose focus and remember how badly you hated high school geometry class. Don't do that. This is really important in construction. And all this means in this case is 36 squared plus 26 squared is going to equal this distance squared. And this is the distance everybody strains to figure out with a tape measure and moving the string back and forth. Now, 36 squared is, I think, 12, 1296. Thank you, Ben. So let's drop down in here, 1296 plus 626? 76. 676. Mm -hmm. Okay, 26 squared is 676, which equals how much? 1,972. 1,972. 
Now the square root, which is what we really need to have in order to use, make this measurement meaningful, of 1,972, which is represented like this, equals 44.407. 44.407. And 0 .407 times 12 equals 4.884. 4.884. Now for those of you who love the metric system, you're laughing at me right now and it doesn't bother me at all. What this means is, so far we've learned that this distance right here is 44 feet, 4.884 inches. 0.884 inches doesn't mean anything to me or you, but I happen to know that 0.884 is very close to 7 eighths of an inch. Okay, the way you determine that is take 0.884 times 16. And the answer to that is my worthy assistant breaks out his Android phone. Why he uses Android, I couldn't tell you, but. 84 times 16 14.144 okay 14 14.144 sixteenths is 7 eighths of an inch so we have just laboriously determined that the length of that hypotenuse is 44 feet 4 and 7 eighths inches I don't know if this is infuriating or amusing but it's very useful in construction and I'm going to show you how to lay that out on site first thing I'm going to do is use the nails that I put in a couple days ago because they are close and I'm going to get two parallel lines on the long sides of the rectangle. This is one of my favorite knots. I call it a fiddle string knot. I don't think that's what it's called. I think it's actually called an engineer's knot. You just create a loop and twist it oh, five or six or seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six. Call it good. Drop it over the nail. Pull the slack with your left hand and take up the slack with your right hand. And you can pull that tight enough to break the string or tip over the batter board, whichever happens first, if you want. It's a good way to tighten up a line. We have two parallel lines. They are exactly, or you know, within the thickness of the string, 26 feet apart. We have that part of our dilemma solved because we have the right setback from the property line and, and, and. So now we need to get the other, the ends of the rectangle in place square. We start that by determining which point on these two parallel lines is going to be the control point that everything else will orient off of. And in this case, it's the point that's closest to the required setback back in the corner. The control point has to be the 10 foot setback that the county insists on from the back property line. And just to make sure that there's no confusion at inspection time, we're going 11 feet because we can afford that distance in the front. Now they don't care about the overhang on the roof or anything like that, you know, where the gutter sweeps out. That doesn't matter to them. What they care about is where the building contacts the building lot. So I'm coming to 11 feet I'm using my plumb bob to drop down and my trusty assistant, the owner of the property, Ben Brewster, is going to put a mark on the string within a quarter inch is fine. Yep. Very good. So that ever so faint mark right there is the hill to die on. Everything will be measured and calculated and reference off of that point. The first thing we're going to do is measure down 36 feet from that point to get the second building corner located. Okay, let her go. Come on down. So this is the mark. It's 36 feet from our control point back there. I want to make this real indelible. You can just turn these mason lines while you're kind of scratching it with the end of your carpenter's pencil. This is an earlier mark, so I just blur that out by making it wide and indistinct. So we now have two hills to die on on our layout. Okay, here's the magic. We're gonna pull that hypotenuse, that diagonal, and we're going to mark 
from the point we just established over there onto this string, 44, 4, and 7 eighths, like this. So the mark is 44, 4, and 7 eighths, but we're cutting a foot down there so that Ben can hold it snug. So I'm gonna mark 45, 4, and 7 eighths where it intersects that string when the string is free, which is right. Got our band mark, yes, mark. This is something that is absolutely imperative when you're doing this move. That the person holding the end of the tape is able to brace the tape off of an immobile object, in this case, Ben's shin, so the line can be pulled tight enough to get an accurate reading. When the reading's exactly right, he says, mark, and then I, or the other person making the mark on the tape at the other end of the hypotenuse, will know that the tape is, in fact, exactly where it needs to be to get the right dimension. So essentially, the last move here is to transfer the length of the rectangle down the string from the end of the hypotenuse that we established just a few minutes ago. Ben's doing the same thing. He's holding 12 inches on the mark on the string, and I'm marking 37 feet on the line right here. All four corners are marked onto two string lines. We're gonna pull the end strings across the batter boards, nail them down, and then do the obligatory check. All right, so you see that stake is bent, boys? Yeah. Can you boys see the stake is bent? It's not badly bent, and it's a flat stake. Now I could lay it down on the concrete and smash it. If I had an anvil, I could do that. Or I can use Newton's first law, I think. A body at motion tends to remain in motion. Watch this. How about that? Not bad. So that's it. And obviously, some of you are saying, well, yeah, but that's as, as simple as a building layout can be in your right. It's a rectangle for crying out loud. But you can use this principle on very complex layouts also. The idea of putting a pencil mark on a tight line to set in space, really, in a particular plane, a particular point. And the idea of using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, instead of gradually working it in by two guys going back and forth comparing a changing diagonal measurement. Throw that idea away and learn to set a string, put a mark on it, pull across that mark nice and tight to another string in another point. Mark it in space, really, which is what you're doing on a string, and then using that to move forward and get your building exactly right. We're laid out. The subgrade's in. It's time to start digging for the footings and setting forms.